want to welcome you if you're visiting the uh, Granite Bay Hilltop Church. We know that we've got folks that are watching on Amazing Facts Television and uh, Facebook and uh, Internet and other different venues. And it's good to see you here today. Some are here because they had uh, planned in their schedules to be part of our grand opening that was going to be happening today. Uh, so I'm trusting most people know that that's been postponed uh, for a little while for a, a number of reasons. But um, we're just so glad if you are here today, pray the Holy Spirit speaks to you. Um, if you did not know, uh, the, the Bachelor family in our travels among the children of men, we picked up COVID. And uh, so I want to thank you for your prayers. And we're all doing fine. This has been a few weeks and we're, you're all safe. I'm probably the safest person in the room right now because I got all the antibodies. But um, uh, Karen and Nathan did fine. I, I'll tell you, friends, I got the industrial strength version. Uh, so uh, I mean it. I, you know, I've been really healthy my whole life. And so this is probably as sick as I ever was. And there are two or three days that uh, Karen was checking the life insurance policy. <laughs> so <clears throat> so uh, but uh, really good to be with you today. I hope you'll be patient with me. Uh, you know, I feel great. Uh, you know, matter of fact, in some ways, I feel better than before. I haven't been able to wear this suit in years. <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, I feel really good about that. I had all these aches and pains from playing racquetball that are gone now because I haven't played in a month. But um, what it does is it, it hits your wind. And so you'll probably notice a couple times it's going to sound like my billows have shrunk a little bit. But uh, I, I really wanted to share this message with you today. It's such an important subject that uh, I, I trust the Lord will get us through. If I run out of air, the sermon will be over. But in the meantime, I'm going to preach the word. Amen? Amen. And you'll pray for me along the way. Um, this subject of knowing the Lord may be the most important thing I've ever talked about. I don't know that it'll get a lot of hits on YouTube or go viral, but either way, I'm convinced it's one of the most important things I could ever talk about because it is the life and death issue for the Christian. You know, I, I appreciate knowledge. I'm fascinated by technology, by um, just the wisdom and things that are going on in the world. You know, I'm fascinated with things like nuclear submarines and how people can live six months underwater and those machines can be powered for years. All of that is amazing to me. Um, I heard about an experiment some of you may know about. It's called ITER, I-T-E-R, and that stands for the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. It is the biggest and most ambitious attempt to harness the energy produced by forcing two atoms to become one. That's known as fusion. The $25 billion experiment in France is a joint project of the European Union, China, India, Japan, South Korea, Russia, and the US. It's a large-scale international project. Parts are made all across the world, and they come together, and they have to fit together like a puzzle, and it has to work. The ultimate goal is for it to do what no fusion experiment has done before, produce more heat than it consumes. The challenge is essentially to build a miniature star inside a laboratory and then control it. The heart of the experiment, now catch this friends, is a 23,000 ton cylinder where intense superconducting magnets will try to keep a 150 million degree, do you catch that? 150 million degree Celsius plasma contained long enough for fusion to occur. They're basically trying to reproduce what the sun does in this building. They expect the budget to go from 25 to 64 million. They're way over budget now. By the way, it will not be a generator when they're done. It's an experiment. If it works, then they want to move on to build reactors that can help power the world with clean, almost unlimited energy. I looked at the science of that, and I'm not going to go into it all. I'll just tell you that, um, by the way, 
Sometimes a pastor might get fusion and fission mixed up. This is fusion. This is very important. If we get it mixed up, it doesn't matter. If the nuclear scientists get it mixed up, we're done for. <laughs> but there is a difference between the fission and the fusion. But this thing is basically going to have the, the explosion of a sun, 25, what did they say there? 150 million degrees going on. Magnets big enough to pick up a battleship. That knowledge, to me, is astounding. It's astounding that they could do something like that. I'd love to go to the International Space Station. I love technology. But you know, the Bible tells us in the last days, people will run to and fro and knowledge will increase. And I don't think anybody here is going to contest that knowledge has exploded. The question is, what kind of knowledge? You could work on a nuclear reactor and come home and yell at your wife. Is that knowledge the right kind of knowledge? I believe in, you know, science and medicine and technology and, uh, uh, you know, I'm fascinated by philosophy and, and psychology. We get to watch that department a little bit. But uh, all of that knowledge is wonderful, but it's not the most important knowledge. The most important knowledge is to know God. And sometimes I'll have to be honest with you, friends. I wonder if there's something wrong with me because I watch people going through their lives and they seem indifferent about the most important thing they could know. And I think, Lord, is there something wrong with me? Why is it for me the most important thing in the world would be to know God? If there's a God and he made everything that all the nuclear fission reactors are made out of, why would we not want to know him? That to me would be the ultimate joy. The ultimate goal is to know God. You see, we've been separated from God because of sin. Before sin, Adam and Eve could talk to God like I'm talking to you. They knew God. He walked and talked with them in the garden. It was a very personal thing. But then because of sin, man lost a whole dimension. There are angels in this room. Uh, God said he's in this place. But we've been cut off from that. And it's like we stopped believing in it. We believe in wireless. Everyone here believes in wireless. Some are using it right now. I mean, we can't see it, but we believe in it. The spiritual world is just as real. And God wants to be known by us. Nothing is more important than that. And yet it seems like the world is so indifferent to it. I saw a bumper sticker years ago. It said, and maybe it'll be on the screen here. Yeah, there it is. No God, no life. No God, no life. I know Carlos is in the back translating, and that did not work for him just now. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> he'll fix it. I know he will. But in English, of course, no God, no life. But if you know God, you will know life. This is eternal life, that you might know him. Now, the world's preoccupied with knowledge, but it's often the wrong kind of knowledge. And, I, you know, I think it's good to pursue knowledge. You read Proverbs, it's pretty clear. But if you pursue every earthly field of knowledge and you, you neglect knowing God, you've lost it all. That has to be the priority. Jeremiah 9, 23, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, and let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this. Don't miss that word glory. That he understands and knows me. You know, if you're going to be proud of knowing something, be thankful that you know God. I know that um, there's a lot of people out there that have much much better theological training than I do. I cannot speak Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, but I praise God that I know God. Amen. And I think that if you know everything else theologically, but you don't know God, then you're in that class of people where the Lord's going to say, I'm sorry, I don't know you, but Lord, we preached in your streets and we taught and we cast out devils and did many wonderful works. And what good is all of that if you don't know God? 
1 Corinthians 3.19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. I remember reading about Mark Twain, and he was a very brilliant speaker, had an incredibly creative mind. He went through some tragedies in life where he basically turned away from God. His brother died and burnt in a uh, riverboat explosion and a lot of other tragedies, and he just he thought God burned people in hell for and ever and ever. And like others, it just he turned away from God, became pretty much an agnostic. Well, he was a good speaker, great writer, lost almost all of his money through bad business investments. He invested in some typesetting machine for years and just lost almost everything. So he had to go on the road speaking to make money. And he went on tours across America, went to Europe, and, and he became incredibly famous. It was very successful. And as he was traveling around Europe, people were just so um, entertained with his wit and his humor that he was invited to the palaces and the parliaments, and he was meeting everybody, kings and queens all across Europe in this very triumphant tour. And his daughter was with him, and she was so proud of her dad. She said, Papa, I said, soon you're going to know everybody except God. And he did. He knew everybody. But if you don't know God, what good is it? Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. Listen to Paul's priority. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet, indeed, I count all things for loss. For, listen, the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish, that I might gain Christ, and jump to verse 10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Friends, do you have that hunger? If you didn't start today, I sure hope you do at the end, that you might know God. Don't you want to know him better? I mean, what could be more precious than that? The supreme goal in life, in my estimation, is to know God and his love and share God and his love. This church exists for those goals, to know God and his love and to share God and his love. Everything else is secondary. So is it the priority in your life? Solomon, God said, Lord, uh, the Lord said to Solomon, what do you want? He said, I want wisdom. That, of course, was after he became king. Before that, before Solomon died, he was having a talk and a walk with his father, and David appealed to his son. See, it's one of the rare cases where David was still alive and his son was coronated king. And he says, as for you, by the way, 1 Chronicles 28, 8. I won't have all the scriptures on the screen, but I think I have this one. 1 Chronicles 28, 9, rather. As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all the hearts and understands the intents of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Now you realize, of course, knowing God is different than knowing about God. What we're talking about today is not knowing stuff about God. We're talking about knowing him, having a personal relationship with him where you're, you're talking to him. You know, this is how it describes Enoch. It says he walked with God. He had that personal relationship. It also says that, by the way, about Noah. Noah walked with God. The people who live in the last days are going to be a people, the ones who succeed in the last days, who walk with God. Now, when you think about it, it's almost outrageous that I would be suggesting that to you that uh, you and I could know God. Because in, in reality, I mean, you and I, we can't even comprehend how big the sky is and how vast the universe is. Isaiah 55, 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I mean, how can you and I possibly know God? And yet he wants us to know him. You'll never come to the place where you know everything about God. It's like Thomas Edison who said, we only know one millionth part of one percent about anything. <laughs> we only know one millionth of one percent about anything. 
And if you're middle age, you've probably learned that the longer you live, the more you know you don't know. <laughs> Isn't that right? There is a time when you peak as a teenager and you think you've got it figured out. But from there, you realize, and something else happens is the, the longer you live, the more you realize your parents knew. It's a strange dynamic that occurs. Romans 11.33, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments in his ways past finding out. So when we talk about knowing God, it's not that you're going to know everything about God. His ways are past finding out. But he wants to have a personal, loving relationship with you. And he uses the most tender examples a father and a child, a mother and its baby. Jesus uses the example of a friend. And this is how he wants to know you. Now, there's a story in the Bible about um, Moses. And he probably had one of the closest relationships with God of anybody you can read about. And you read in Exodus 33, and this is after the whole terrible golden calf debacle. God was going to wipe out the children of Israel and make a nation of Moses. And Moses said, Lord, hey, if I could ask something special, let me tell you what I want. Don't make a nation out of me. But he articulates in Exodus 33, 18, he says, please, he asks politely, show me your glory. Now, what did he mean by that? You ever wondered if you could see an angel? What would it do for your faith if you could, like, see an angel? First of all, it ought to scare you because you don't know if it's a good angel or a bad angel and what he's up to, right? But uh, if you can see an angel or something like that, I mean, just think about the power of that. I've often thought, oh, Lord, if I, you know, just little miracles, things that will strengthen my faith. But to say, Lord, show me your glory. Did he want to see a bright light? No. He's saying, reveal yourself to me. I want to know you. Pull aside the veil, Lord. I want to be with you. And God understood his request. He said, all right, Moses, I can do that for you. I will appear to you. You won't be able to look me straight in the face because no man can do that and live. Then you go to Exodus 34 where it actually happens. And it says, the Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him there. Can you imagine standing by God? The Lord stood by Moses and he proclaimed. Now God speaks. The Lord, the Lord merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and by no means clearing the guilty. He revealed his character. Now, there's no comment that Moses made that said, you know, his fingernails were really long and he had three tattoos on his left bicep. And there's none of that. It doesn't describe anything about him physically. What it does is it describes who he is in his character. So when you and I are saying we want to know the Lord, it's not that we want to know what color his hair is. We're wanting to know what his characteristics are. Well, who is he? You know, when you fall in love with somebody, you're falling in love with their character. If you're falling in love with the external, that lasts a little while, but, uh, you know, those things fade over time. The character can actually get better while the outward man grows old, the Bible says. Show me your glory. Now, when we're talking about knowing God, let's just settle something in case you have any question. God already knows us. Isn't that right? Psalm 139, verse 1. David said, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts are far off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. For there's not a word on my tongue, but behold, Lord, you know it all through. God not only knows what you said, he knows what you're going to say. He knows what you're going to say before you say it. Jeremiah 1.5 before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Even before you were born, God knew you. And you go to Jeremiah 12, 3. But you, O Lord, know me. You've seen me, and you've tested my heart towards you. 
John 1, 47, when uh, Jesus saw Nathanael coming, he said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Now, they'd never met. And Nathanael said, Lord, how do you know me? Of course, he didn't know Jesus was God at that point. But he's saying, Lord, how do you know me? And Jesus said, oh, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, he had been under the fig tree praying about the Messiah. He said, I saw you there. Of course, Christ sees all of us all the time. He knows everything about us. And Zacchaeus is up in a tree. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down. They'd never met. The Lord knows us. Some of you spent half of your lives you didn't know God. You weren't a Christian. You weren't a believer. But God knew you. And he had a plan for your life. He's always known you. So as we talk about knowing the Lord, the part of the relationship that has a problem is Adam ran from God. You and I don't know him. He knows everything about everybody. 2 Timothy 2.19, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those that are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Jesus said the good shepherd knows his sheep, and the sheep know the shepherd. And then John 2.25, the Bible says, Christ had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. God knows all about us. Unfortunately, the big problem in the world, and some in the church, is that people really don't want to know God. When you think about it, it's, it's crazy. You know, I, I, I'm amazed how often I see people surfing their phones. Uh, we did a, an amazing fact in the Philippines. We were sitting in front of a, um, a mall, and we were doing something on cell phones. More texting, I think, happens in the Philippines than any other country in the world. That was the amazing fact. And we talked about the guy who had the record speed for texting. But while we were videotaping this, I saw a mall with hundreds of young people. And they were all lined up, sitting on these benches and these um, um, planters. And they all had their phones. And they're elbow to elbow with each other. But they're not looking at each other. And they're all looking at the phones. They're probably texting the person next to them. <laughs> Any of you ever text your spouse in the other room? the house and and I see them all doing this and they're all searching and they're all and I'm thinking to myself what are they looking for sadly most people are not looking for God we're all searching people have this vacuum in our hearts and they're wanting to know God but most of the world is not interested Job 21 11, they send forth their little ones like a flock and their children dance. They sing to the tambourine and the harp. They rejoice to the sound of the flute. They spend their days in wealth, and in a moment they go down to the grave. Yet they do not say, yet they say to God, depart from us, for we do not desire the knowledge of your ways. That's describing most of the world. Interested with the pleasures of this life before they go to the grave, they say, God, don't bother us. We don't desire the knowledge of your ways. That sums it up, friends, right there. So much of the world just doesn't want to know God. They're afraid he's going to interfere with their plans. But how sad, what plan could really matter if God's not part of it? John 3, 19, the Lord said, This is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. I don't want to know the Lord. It might be convicting. Romans 1, there's a lot of verses I could pick. Paul said, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They want to know everything in the world about everything, but the most important thing, God gave them up to a debased mind to do those things that are not fitting because they do not have a desire for the knowledge of God. Like the Pharaoh you know, by the way, not knowing God is fatal if you didn't realize that. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And he was enslaving people like the devil. 
Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, now notice right there, it said people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It's not that God's destroying people because they don't know. Notice that next part of the verse, because you have rejected knowledge. It's not just that they don't know, they don't want to know. So many people are lost, not because they don't know, but they don't look. Jesus said, seek and you'll find. And God wants to be sought after. He said, if you search for me, you'll find me. Jeremiah 29, 13. If you search for me with all of your heart. It's like David said to Solomon. If you seek for him, he'll be found of you. So God wants us to know him, but he must be pursued. You know, if a man spots a young lady and, and she gets his attention and he thinks she'd be a great prospect, um, I think I'll propose. Well, if they don't know each other, that's not going to go very well. Uh, he's got a pursuer. Amen? And how's that happen? Try and get to know them. Spend some time. Communicate. Find out what their personality is. Little by little, you reveal who you are. Hopefully, they'll like that. And so you uh, develop a relationship. Well, God wants to know us. And keep in mind, when we're talking about knowing God, the Bible says Adam knew Eve and she had a baby. And so in the Hebrew mind, knowing someone is about as intimate as it gets. It means it's a love relationship. It's personal. And God wants to have that love relationship with you. Jesus said, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. It's not the religious trappings on the outside, but he that does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name we've cast out devils and done many wonderful works in your name. And he'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, we're going to say more about that in a minute. What does it mean to know the Lord? One thing it definitely means is that you do not practice lawlessness because you know him and you don't want to hurt him. On the other hand, you look at the sons of Eli. 1 Samuel 2.12, the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. So knowing God is going to, at least for one thing, mean that you know what his will is. You know what he wants. Now, I've spent some time kind of setting this up. I want to talk to you now. How do we know God? I got five points. How do we know God? I'm going to try and make it easy. They're all W. Wonders, you know him through his word, his ways, his witness, and his worship. You'll see him up on the screen, I think, but I'll repeat him again. Wonders, word, ways, witness, worship. We know him through his wonders. Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day they utter speech, and night unto night they reveal knowledge. Through the things that God made, he reveals himself. If you want to know God, the earth is full of the glory of God. You look around. I mean, to me, I'm embarrassed that I used to believe in evolution. Because now, I look around, I just see God in everything. I just all the interworking systems and in uh, nature and, and science and the things that happen in life. It's just like I, I have God sightings all the time. And uh, creation is one of the places we see that. You look in the book of Job 12, verse 7. But ask now the beasts, and they will teach you. <clears throat> and the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you. And the fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this, in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. The creatures that you look at. You look up in the sky at night. Look at the birds in the sky. You look in the water if you can scuba dive. You, you look on the, the land. You look around. Look at the animal kingdom. And there's so many wonders in the world. We can know God. You can learn a lot about God through what he made. The one who opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. And how the, the symbiotic relationships 
in nature. Just, it's such a wonder. And that's your creator. You know him through his word. Now, these are not in uh, order of priority. I just did it the way I did it. Jeremiah 31, 33. And this is one that uh, bears some emphasis. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my law in their minds, and I'll write it in their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will know me, from the least of them to the greatest. All right, notice that. This is the covenant that saves. It's a new covenant. By the way, it's in the Old Testament. This is also repeated in Hebrews 8, 10 through 12. The new covenant is all about knowing God. And how does he say that, what is the evidence that they know God? I put my law in their minds and their hearts. So if you want to know God, what's one of the most important ways you can know God? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, how do you get Christ in you? He is the Word incarnate. As you're reading your Bible, you're getting to know Him. And you know who He's like, and He speaks to you through His Word. Jesus said, John 5, 39, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. These are they that testify of me. You want to know the Lord? This is a love letter from God. You know, it's amazing that um, people used to fall in love long distance before the Internet. I know some folks that they did all of their dating through letters. And uh, for me, that seems like it would be a lot of work. Uh, but... Uh, when I was at summer camp, they used to make me write home, and it would say, Dear Mom, how are you? I'm fine. Having fun. Love, Doug. This is the same card every week. They made you write your parents. But so writing was... Anyway, but, you know, people have written some beautiful, eloquent letters, uh, and they fall in love with who the person is, even though they're not there with them, because they feel like they're getting the essence of their heart. And so as you read the Bible, you're getting the essence of God's heart. That just popped into mind years ago. There was a, um, a story. I don't know if any of you ever heard of Cyrano de Bergiac. Yeah, it's, uh, certainly it's a classic story about this man in France. And he was a brilliant guy, extremely eloquent, very brave, best swordsman in the country. It's a story. It's not true but he had a very big nose. I mean, enormous. He fell in love with, I think, a second cousin named Roxanne, but he thought, she'll never have anything to do with me because I'm just plain old ugly. Well, Roxanne was smitten with this actor she saw on the stage one day, and his name was Christian. And uh, the guy was an imbecile, but he could read a script, and he was good-looking. Christian goes to Cyrano. I'm truncating the story. And he said, oh, you know, I'd, I'd like to write her a letter, but I don't know what to say. She's a sophisticated woman. And, and Cyrano thought, oh, this is a chance for me to talk about my love for her. So he begins to write love letters to Roxanne, signs Christian's name. She falls madly in love with Christian. That not only is he good looking, I've never heard such prose and romance and such eloquence. And uh, later she, he has to talk to her face to face, and she thought, what happened? He's a knucklehead. That's not the word they use in the story. But uh, then Cyrano tries to redeem the relationship. He stands outside her balcony at night, actually uses his voice. She thinks she's talking to Christian from her balcony, and he says all these things, wins her heart back again. Well, it's this ugly guy out there. But uh, she's so smitten with who he is and his, his heart and his words. At the end of the story, Finally, she finds out who it really was, and they declare their love for each other, and he dies, of course, because it's a tragedy. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, I think there was a lesson in there somewhere <laughs> about knowing that, uh, you know, it's who the person is. So when you read the Bible, you know, we don't know really. The Bible goes to great lengths saying, don't make an idol. Don't try and figure out what I look like. I want you to know who I am. And Jesus wants to reveal himself to you. He's a person. 
You are made in the image of God. We've all got personality because we get that concept from God. He's got the ultimate good personality. You know, I think it's in the book Desire of Ages. To know God is to love him. If you know God, you will love him. You know, all the problems you and I have with obedience are because we don't love him enough. If you loved him better, you would obey him better. So if you want to serve him better, you've got to know him better. How's that going to happen? Through the wonders, through the word. How much time do you take with the word? I think a lot of you are probably pretty well versed in politics right now. And we'd have a real interesting discussion if I asked your opinion on the vaccine. <laughs> that's been a very polarizing, uh, I was amazed how much email I got. I had no idea how politically polarizing that is among Christians, not just our church, all Christians. And uh, the whole society, I better change subject right away. To, to, <laughs> just get away from that. But uh, people know all kinds of things. Folks spend a lot of time reading the paper and surfing the internet. And, how much time do you spend seeking after God, wanting to know Him? So we know Him through His Word. Jesus said, you search the Scriptures, they testify of me. Luke 24, the Bible says, begin it in Moses and all the prophets, by Luke 24, 27, begin it in Moses, all the prophets, He expounded unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. That's Jesus, by the way. No New Testament's even written. He says all of it, New and Old Testament. You want to know who he is, he reveals himself. And you got to take time to get to know him. There's some effort involved. If you study to become an expert in any field, it's because you invested time in learning. Well, if you want to know God, this is one of the principal ways you're going to get to know him, through his word. Christ said, 1 John 3, 6, whoever abides in him does not sin Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. So the way that we've got the victory over the sin is by knowing him. How are we going to know him? Through the word. We know him through his ways, through the providence of God. Now, time does not permit for me to take you through the Bible. I mean, I could talk about the incredible providence you see in the book of Esther. You can see the hand of God working in such marvelous ways. doesn't make itself clear right away. But when you get to the end of the book, you look back and say, wow, look at how God delivered his pe people through his ways. Do you see God's hand? Do you see him in your life? Have you gone through experiences before and you wonder, why did this happen? And you look back and say, praise the Lord. I, I could see that he was working in the background, all things together for the good of those that love him. You look, I'll take, for example, the story of Joseph. I mean, poor Joseph. He was the uh, beloved son of a father, sold by his brother. He's a good kid. He said too much about his dreams. But other than that, he's a good kid. That doesn't record him doing anything wrong. Jealousy. They sell him. He becomes a slave for years. And here he had been pampered son of a wealthy nomad. And then he's falsely accused. He does the right thing. He serves God. And in spite of being pure and noble and honest, he's falsely accused of a terrible crime and put in prison for years. The best years of his life, you might think, his youth and his teen years, a slave and a prisoner. You could become really bitter if you want to, going through something like that. Joseph knew God, and he believed that God had a destiny for him. That's what all those dreams were about. He didn't know how it was going to work out, but I think he trusted God. And he said, I don't know why I'm here right now, but where, Lord, if I'm going to be his servant, I'm going to be the best servant I can be. And God blessed him. He said, if I'm going to be a prisoner, I'm going to be the best prisoner I can be. And God blessed him in the prison. And then something marvelous happened with the Pharaoh's dreams. And in one day, Joseph goes from the prison to the palace. And he becomes the prime minister of the most powerful kingdom in the world. Years later, of course, he, you know the story, he reconnects with his brothers, and I want to get to heaven and see their faces when he says, I am Joseph. <clears throat> I want to see the video of that. Or DVD. I don't know what they're using up there. But listen to what Joseph says in Genesis 45. 
Joseph says to his brothers, please come near to me. They were terrified when he said, I'm Joseph. So they came near. He said, I am Joseph. First time they're hearing him speak in Hebrew. He had been talking to him in Egyptian. He said, I am Joseph, your brother, who you sold into Egypt. But now, do not be grieved or angry with yourselves. I can just hear Jesus saying that to you and me. He said, look, I don't want to be you beat up on yourself. I died because of you. But this was part of God's plan. Do not be angry or grieve with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. And God sent me to preserve your posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me, but God. So we get to know God through his ways. Look for his ways. Through his witness. We're on point number four now if you're counting. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For it is God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We know God through sharing God. So we not only know God and looking for God as a person, but God is saying, look, if you want to really know me, then don't just try to, you know, shower me with words of love. Show love to your brother, and you will get to know me. And it's in our interaction and practicing the love of God with people, we get to know him better. Did that make sense? And so, you know, when Christ sends us out to do mission, part of what's happening is not just that you're reaching others, but he is reaching you as you try to reach others. He is revealing himself to you as you, to, you try to reach others. I learned so much more about God being involved in ministry. And even as I stand before you like now and I'm teaching and preaching, God speaks to me. And he's revealing things to me as I try to be a channel to you. So you will come to know God better in your witness. The Bible says, how many of you want to be spirit-filled? You ever be spirit-filled? Why are you going to be spirit-filled? I will give you my spirit that you might be my witnesses. And so he says, look, I'm going to reveal myself to you that it might go through you to others. And so as you say, Lord, here am I, send me, you are opening yourself up to knowing him better because he wants to go through you to others. And you read stories in the Bible like the, the Good Samaritan. You know, you got three characters, four characters, the guy that fell among the thieves, and you got a Levite, you got a priest, and you got a Samaritan. Which one of the three knew God? It was the despised Samaritan that clearly knew God because he showed love and compassion for someone else. See what I'm saying? And I think that the Lord even revealed himself to uh, him more through that experience. So, for the believer, the purpose of life, our mission, is to know God and to make him known. You've probably heard that before. We want to know God and make him known. So he's known also through his witness. And then finally, how do we know God? Oh, wait, I want to give you another verse on the other one before I leave that point. 1 John 4.20. If someone says, I love God, and he hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God who he has not seen? So one of the ways we demonstrate that we know God is by what? By loving our brothers. We say, I know God, and we hate each other. You don't know God. Amen? Amen. All right, and then finally, we know him through his worship. God reveals himself to us through worship. Now, knowing God is not just God talking to you through his word. Knowing God is you're talking to him. When you come and you sing his praises, when you come just to talk about how worthy he is, that's where you get the word worship, you come to adore him because you love him. He reveals himself to you in the, in the uh, uh, experience of worship. You get to know him better. Ephesians 3.17, this is a great verse. 
that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have, be able to comprehend, catch this, with all the saints, what is the width and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be full, filled with the fullness of God. What a magnificent verse, that we might know the love of God in that way. I think about Isaiah when he was there in the presence of God, and he heard the angels worshiping God, saying, holy, holy, holy. In that context of worship there in heaven, Isaiah finally saw himself, and he repented, and he went through a dramatic conversion experience. But it was, it was in the experience of worship that that happened. And it, we often come to know him in that experience, not just uh, public, but private worship. In the book Steps of Christ, page 98, there's a great quote. Pray in your closet as you go about your daily labor. Let your heart often be lifted up to God. It was thus that Enoch walked with God. These silent prayers rise like precious incense. It's, it's an attitude of worship before the throne of grace. Satan cannot overcome him whose heart is thus stayed upon God. You will be safe if you live in an attitude of worshiping God. We don't just worship God once a week. People sometimes accuse Seventh-day Adventists and say, oh yeah, you guys just worship God once a week. We don't believe that, do we? No, we gather together, we rest once a week in corporate worship, but we're to worship God every day. We're to walk with God and worship God all the time. And you know him through worship. So what do you gain if you know God? Everything. This is eternal life, Christ said, that they might know thee, the only true God. Everything hinges on knowing him. Look at Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. You can actually swap that around. Know that I'm God and you'll be still. It works that way too. And another verse to prove that, Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. Now, that was kind of discouraging. No one knows the Son except the Father. Jesus, I want to know you. Keep reading. No one knows the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. And God said, yes. We say, Jesus, show me your glory. Show me the glory of the Father. Will he, will he listen to you? He wants to reveal himself to you. You know what the next verse said? Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Where does that rest come from? Knowing God. Now, knowing God is also comforting because if you know him and you know his love, and you know he's your friend. Uh, have you ever had a friend in high places? He can be really great. If you're in trouble and you got a friend in high places, I got pulled over by a highway patrolman once, and uh, there in the dark, he shined his flashlight in my face. He said, Pastor Doug. <laughs> I won't tell you what I was doing, but he felt it necessary to slow me down. And uh, he had been going to an evangelistic meeting that I had been doing at a town nearby. And I thought, praise the Lord for friends in high places. <laughs> and so I got a warning of grace. And going through this recent uh, health challenge. Um, I, and I, I so appreciate, you know, the health workers that are doing their, their very best. But let's face it, sometimes you go to the hospital and folks line up. I don't know if you've had an emergency room experience before. I praise the Lord, I wasn't hospitalized, but Karen took me to emergency, and they did x-rays and sent me home. But, you know, they're just kind of churning people through the best they can. And uh, sent me home with an over-the-counter prescription, prescription for over-the-counter. I thought, here, I'm dying. I thought I was. I wasn't. But um, I'm just a baby. And, uh, <clears throat> but I was sick. Karen, can I have an amen? Yeah, I was just sick. <laughs> and... Uh, I felt like I was just trapped in the system. But then I remembered, I got some friends in high places. 
I got on my phone, I thought, oh, I'm calling Dr. So-and-so, and Dr. So-and-so, and Dr. So-and-so. I called three or four doctors, men and women, friends of mine, that are way up in the system. And man, they got on the phone, they called the drugstore, all of a sudden things were happening within an hour. Everything I need, I had. Because I had some friends. I'm sorry if you don't have those friends, I can't tell you their names. But um, it was wonderful. And everything began to turn around right away because I was able to get the personal treatment that I thought I needed for my particular problems. But uh, I think we all know it's wonderful to have friends in high places. The book of James, chapter 2, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Catch this. And he was the friend of God. Is God your friend? Exodus 33, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Wouldn't you like to have that experience, friends? Where God speaks to you face to face like that. Acts 13, 22. And he gave testimony and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. That you could just be tied heart to heart with Jesus as your friend. You know, you hear it all the time. You grow up and sometimes I think it, we get callous and it just goes over our heads. People say, do you know the Lord as your Savior? Is he your Lord and Savior? Do you know the Lord? And we say, yeah, yeah, I know the Lord. You know, leave me alone. And then you ask yourself in your quiet moments, do I really know him? Do you have that person? Do you walk and talk with him? Do you run into situations and you say, Lord, I know what you want me to do? Because I know you, I know what you want me to do in this situation. That, I think, is a pretty good definition of what it means. Hebrews 4.14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we don't have a high priest that cannot sympathize with our weakness, but he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore boldly come to the throne of grace. God wants to save you. He would not go through everything he went through to save you if you couldn't be saved. He loves you desperately. The Lord wants to love you. All right, let me say that differently. The Lord wants to have a loving, knowing relationship with you a thousand times more than you do. He longs for you to long after him. Now, this is an especially important subject. I started out telling you that for the last days. Because the ones who are going to succeed in the last days and do the greatest work are the ones who know God. Daniel 11. You know, that's in the last chapters of Daniel. Daniel 11:32. Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery, but... The people who know their God will be strong and carry out great exploits. Who's going to do the work in the last days? Those that know God. They've got that personal relationship. Now, before I tie it off, I should mention, you're never going to come to the place where you say, bingo, God, I know God, I'm good. It's something that is ongoing. Even through eternity, they'll always be bottomless um, resources of God you'll never be able to plumb. I mean, we'll always be learning about God. But Hosea 6, verse 3, let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. Always we should be pursuing God. 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3. Now I'm going to put two verses together, but I want you to catch this. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you might grow thereby... Now look at 2 Peter 3, 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We grow through the sincere milk of the word. Be growing in the knowledge all the time, knowing him better and better and better. How many of you married somebody and you thought you knew who you married? <laughs> you know, I'm going to finish this. But then you found that after a while, you didn't know them as well as you thought. But as you're married longer, you get to know them more. And the more you're with them, and as the years go by, you know them better and better and better. Now, in marriages, it may not always be good. But in your relationship with God, knowing them better is always going to be better. It's going to be good, 
knowing that more is going to always be an upgrade because he's going to reveal his glory to you and his goodness and his love. You know, uh, I'm always uh, touched by some of these incredible reunions of people that love each other, that are separated by circumstances. Uh, it happens a lot with soldiers where, you know, they're deployed and they're uh, in a foreign country and for sometimes, you know, months or even years, they may not be with their family. And then it's great when there's a surprise. You know, mom and, and the kids don't know, but some of the relatives know that dad's coming home. And she's out on the soccer field, and uh, all of a sudden, in the middle of the game, it's all prearranged where dad swaps places with a goalie, and his daughter comes up to kick a goal, and there's dad. You see her scream, and she runs to hug her dad, and the mom comes to hug the dad, and the dog comes running over the field, and he's doing backflips because he knows the dad. And there's this reunion because there's been this separation from someone they know and love, and it's so wonderful to be reunited. You know, I think about the story in the Bible where Joseph is separated from his father for 30-something years. Uh, this is his beloved son. Father thinks he's dead for years. He finds out he's alive. And can you imagine the joy? It says, he fell on his neck and he kissed him a long time. Uh, this love, this reunion. The Bible tells us that when you get to heaven, it's going to be special for those that love the Lord because then we will see him face to face. He wants to have that love relationship with you now. And if you have that, you're going to be yearning and longing after your time with God because uh, nothing is more precious than that. The reason we exist, friends, is to know God and to make Him known. Other knowledge might have value, but if you don't have that as your priority, you're going to lose everything. He that has the Son has life. This is eternal life, that they might know Thee. How many of you want to know Him better? Amen. We're going to sing about it. I'll invite our singers to come up. I think the orchestra is going to help. We're going to sing more about Jesus. If it, you got a hymnal there. It's 245. I invite you to stand. And then we'll pray at the conclusion.
Amen. You sound good. Lord, this is our prayer. Uh, these words, we, we believe we're not just singing them. We want to know you. Every day we want more of you, Lord. Help us to do our part through our lives to seek you as the most important truth person, our friend, our savior, our king. And I pray that you'll reveal yourself to us, Lord, and that we can be transformed by that revelation. Bless each person here. I know that uh, both those that are watching, those that are here, there's always a broad spectrum of challenges. We know through all these things, you're trying to reach us, reach others through us, and often both. Lord, we pray for the Holy Spirit to be on your church. Help us be witnesses in the world right now. Bless us as we go from this place with your presence. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. God bless you, friends. Please remember that uh, we'll be having our happy deacons at